So we'd like to continue. Um, I'd like to introduce Nova Boda, who's in my vocal manipulation and mediation class, to introduce Gon Halevi and Lachlan Brown to perform a few pieces. Hi, good after, good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about castrati and falsettis. So a castrati or a castrato is a type of classical male singing voice that is um, the equivalent to that of a soprano, which is um, a high like female singing voice. Um, the castrati voice is produced by castration of the male singer before puberty, which actually causes them to never reach sexual maturity and causes their voices to be really high. Um, and also it prevents a boy's larynx from being transformed by the normal physiological events of puberty. Um, as a result, the vocal range of prepubescent um, is largely retained and the voice de develops into adulthood in a unique way. Um, Kastrati was really popular in like the late um, 16th, 17th century and it diminished in the 18th century. And the Kastrati's voices were said to um, be, they would basically Basically, any female singer today would be really jealous of a Castrati's voice because of how amazing they sound. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any recordings of Castrati because, well, yeah, there is just one. You're right, but yeah, okay. So, um, Castrati first appeared in Italy in the mid 16th century, and one really famous Castrati singer is Farinelli. Um, he was born in 1705 as Carlo Broschke. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any recordings of his unique voice. However, for the sake of the Farinelli movie that came out in 1994, um, they use this like I-R-C-A-M to recreate his voice by using a female's voice and a male's um, voice to create like a, what a castrati would sound like or what Farinelli would sound like. So due to financial hardships in Farinelli's life, he was forced to be castrated at 12 and sent to one of those schools where they trained castrati. And basically those schools were really vigorous. They had the boys train for, in one hour of singing, doing difficult and awkward pieces, one hour practicing trills, an hour practicing ornamented passaggi, one hour of singing exercises in their teacher's presence in front of a mirror, and one hour of literary study, all of this before lunch. And then after lunch, they would do more musical theory, writing, an hour copying down the same from dictation, and then another hour of literary study. They did all of this so that way the boys could um, be really good by their mid-teens so that no woman or ordinary male could match their talent. Farinelli was really good and um, because of all this training, and stuff. So his um, singing career took off really quickly. And um, by 15, he was already performing in Italy. And he was so good that he actually spent 22 years in the court of Spain singing for the king as like a form of musical therapy. And yeah, so 
he died at the age of 77 in 1782. And um, his remains were actually found by archaeologists and anthropologists and in 2006. And by looking at his body, um, something interesting that they learned about Castrati was that because um, of the castration they and the lack of testosterone, these boys actually, um, their bones didn't harden in the right way that it was supposed to harden. So they had um, this weird disease and um, Farinelli was actually like six feet three inches tall, which is really tall for people back then. Um, so, and this um, also helped them to give um, the singers great lung power and breath capacity. And yeah, so basically Farinelli was like really influential in music and um, his unique voice. And on that note, I'd like to introduce singer and composer Han Haveli, right? All right, thanks. This is Lock and Brown.
Thank you, Gon. Thank you, Lachlan. I should mention that both Gon and Lachlan are students at the Manus Performing College of Arts. They, they changed the name around a lot, but Manus is our <laughs> <laughs> classical music school in the Performing Arts Division at the New School. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions, and I actually made a special request uh, for one of my favorite composers, uh, a piece by John Dowland to close out this small concert. I was curious, when we spoke before, about your early voice. You weren't always singing in this range, were you? Right. Um, so, I mean, as you can tell, that's my speaking voice. I don't speak like this. Um, and yeah, so when I start, started singing, that's, that, this voice was what I tried to develop. Um, but, um, f I mean, boys know we, we are born having a much higher voice, and then it breaks. And before my voice b broke, I was in a choir. And um, the feeling we have when we sing that high, and it applies for sopranos, uh, mezzos, and boys, um, like young boys, um, this feeling is very, very different from singing in this range. And this is just, it was something that I just, I missed a lot when I sang as a baritone, which was for two or three years. Then I talked about it with, with my uh, voice teacher back in Israel, where I come from. Um, and she said that we should try the, this range. So you originally sang as a baritone? Yeah. And a lot of countertenors sing as baritones before they decide to change or develop their voice in a different range? Um, I, I would say so. I, I would say so. It never happens that the speaking voice is at tenor range. I mean, usually if your speaking voice is tenor, which will be like in this range somewhere, uh, for these people, if they break to, the, to their head voice slash falsetto, it's very breathy usually, and they cannot really develop it. It's very rare. And if they can, that's a male soprano. That's very high. But it's very, very rare. All my friends who are countertenors, which I can count on one hand or one finger, um, um, <laughs> they're baritones and the famous counting, ones. Counting yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... So I, you know, Bach was. It was rumored that Bach had, a, as a, as a young boy, had a beautiful soprano voice, and it's often, I think, for composers who write for the voice, they tend to write for the voice that either belongs to them or that they know the best. And I, I often wonder if pieces like this were written with his own youthful voice in mind. And I wanted to say thank you for the piece from Handel's Amira, um, which gives us sort of a, an indication, and with the ornamentation you did, of what. A what a castrati could have possibly sounded like, though we only have adjectives, really, and, and historical documentation to give us an idea of what that voice might have been, um, which I think is enough. We can let our imaginations fly away with us and, and imagine the voice. Um, Nova mentioned the voice that was created at IRCOM, um, in Paris for the movie Farinelli, which I think doesn't go far enough. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, an alto and a, and a countertenor put together, and I think it doesn't push the limits quite far enough to, to the exotic heights that I always imagine with, yeah. from the descriptions of countertenors. Um, if you would please sing us one more piece, that would just be lovely. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I just wanted to comment that there's a, uh, this piece is from around, f was first composed instrumentally in about 1596, but uh, coincides with really the beginning of opera itself. So Jacopo Perry's Daphne, which is 1598 around then, we're not quite, you know, 1598, 1599. This is 1600. It said that John Dallin wrote the lyrics himself and sort of one of my favorite notes that the title, Flow My Tears, then became part of one of my favorite Philip K. Dick novels, Flow My Tears, the policeman said. So, you know, past. Everything's cyclical. It's just all coming around, right? So thank you very much again. We're going to take a short five-minute break um, and set up for the next presentation. Thank you. <laughs>